Welcome to our online service this morning. Can I encourage you to turn to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning? 
um, likely growing up, you had role models, right? People that you looked up to. You might not have known everything about their lives, their character, and their choices, but there was something about their talents, their abilities, something about them that, that you looked up to and were impressed by. For me as a kid, it was Michael Jordan. There was a Gatorade commercial uh, that used to say, I want to be like Mike. And I still remember shooting baskets outside my friend Lars's house. And I was probably 11 years old at the time. And my friend told me that he had, he had seen Michael Jordan dunk from the free throw line in a slam dunk competition. And in my 11-year-old mind, I could not even fathom how that was possible. You know, I could see how somebody could dunk a 10-foot hoop, of course, but to fly through the air for 15 feet before you dunk a 10-foot hoop just did not seem possible to me. It just was unfathomable, and yet it was true, and I ended up seeing it later on. It really was true and possible. In fact, I got the poster as a child and put it on my wall. There was another basketball player around that time by the name of Charles Barkley, and I saw Charles Barkley play against the Seattle Supersonics, my hometown team, one time. A great basketball player. But he said, in talking about being a role model, he said, I'm not paid to be a role model. I'm paid to wreak havoc on the basketball court. Many athletes and entertainers have since said things like that. That, yes, there may be people that look up to me because of my talents, but I'm not meant to be a role model, they'll say. Now, I want to tell you, and I've got great news for us, the Bible is full of tremendous role models. People that, while not perfect, are examples to us as followers of Christ. There's only one that is perfect, and that is Jesus, who lived a perfect life and died for our sin and rose again on the third day. But there are many great examples of people that lived great lives that we can look to and learn from. I think of Ruth. I think of Naomi. I think of Moses and Elijah. The list goes on and on. Not perfect people, but amazing people that we can learn a lot from. I think of Joseph, right? I think of, of Peter, the Apostle Paul. I think every young Christian boy is looked up to and wanted to be like David, who fought lion and bear and the giant Goliath. In Scripture, we can learn from these wonderful wonderful people and learn about their lives and, and, and emulate them. Um, but there are also in Scripture people that we can learn from and not do what they did. There are certain people that are, are not meant to be role models for our lives. In fact, their lives serve as examples of things to avoid, destructive things. We have people like Jezebel and Ahab. We have people like Cain or Athaliah. This lady who ended up killing her grandsons in order to take the throne. You know, most grandparents I know, they spoil their grandkids, but she slaughtered her grandsons. Herod, Demas, just to name a few. Or how about Balaam? Do you remember Balaam in the scripture? No one ever names their son Balaam, and there's a reason for that. He is not someone that we look up to. As we look at 2 Peter, we're going to come across the name Balaam as Peter reminds these Christians of Balaam from the Old Testament times and challenges them as he reminds them of Balaam. Balaam is an example of someone who had great potential, somebody who, by God's mercy, heard from God. God revealed himself to Balaam, which is just incredible to think about, how blessed Balaam was to hear from God and yet... Balaam's heart was so enticed by the love of money and greed, that was his downfall. He led others into sin, and he himself was destroyed in the end. Balaam could have been a hero that we read about in the pages of Scripture, somebody that we name our children after, someone we want to emulate, but instead he lives on in infamy. To give you the context of 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter has warned these early Christians of false teachers that would secretly slip in amongst them. Peter says that these false teachers won't get away with what they're doing, but they will be punished. And he gives some examples of God's just judgment. Last week we saw that false teachers um, dishonor 
uh, and reject authority. We talked about four areas of authority that God has put in place to restrain evil and to reward right conduct. And so Peter is going to talk more about God's righteous judgment and more about what these false teachers look like. And so we read this starting in verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word speaks to our lives. And I pray that you would speak. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would convict us where it's needed. I pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear and feet to obey by your power. We need you, Lord. We don't want to get sidetracked in these times we live in. Help us to fight the good fight to run the race, to finish it for your glory, and to keep the faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there is certainly a lot here in this text, and, and we could spend a number of weeks just looking at the various verses here. We see these false teachers are those who, uh, false teachers and those who follow their teaching are, are people that are living for their appetites. They're bold in their assertions, even though they don't even know what they're talking about. Have you ever met someone that is so confident in what they're saying and yet you know they're wrong? Right? Have you ever met somebody like that and you're thinking, you know, you really speak with boldness and confidence, but you're really wrong uh, about that. In the words of Inigo Montoya, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> you ever met somebody like that? Well, these false teachers are like that. They're confident, but they really don't have a clue what they're talking about. They're unsteady. They're, they're greedy. They're adulterers of heart. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Not only are these false teachers wicked, but they're bold and they're confident in their wickedness. Certainly justifying their sin as they make strong assertions. They come to church. They gather with God's people. They feast with them, even while they entice unsteady souls and are headed towards destruction themselves. Now, Peter gives us an example from the Old Testament to speak about what these false teachers are like. And he gives us the example of Balaam. He says this in verses 15 and 16. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So what is Peter talking about here? What, what is Balaam? What, what is this, um, who is this historical figure? What is this all about? Well, we first read about Balaam in Numbers 22 to 24. Balaam is, in fact, referenced 61 times in the Bible. A few examples are Micah 6.5, Nehemiah 13, 1 and 2. Jude 111, Revelation 2:14. In other words, God wants us to be warned 
um, and to avoid the path that Balaam was on and to avoid people like Balaam. You know, many are like the man who came to work with bandages over both ears. And his boss said, what in the world happened to you? And the man replied, well, you see, I was so busy this morning that when the phone rang, I accidentally picked up the hot iron instead and burned my ear. <laughs> and the boss said, well, that's, that's horrible. I, I really feel for you, but, but why do you have bandages on both ears? And the man said, because they called back. <laughs> he didn't learn from the first mistake, right? He didn't learn from his first ear, from, from one ear being burned, had to burn the other. A lot of people are like this. They're, they're slow to learn the lessons in life. My hope would be that this is not so for us, that we would, yes, learn from our own mistakes when we burn our ear, but we would also learn from the mistakes of others. The book of 1 Corinthians tells us about Israel's history. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. Oh, that we would be instructed, that we would learn and grow and not make the mistakes others have made and not have to learn the hard way ourselves. So what do we learn from Numbers about Balaam, son of Beor? So Israel, the nation of Israel, is on the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan of Jericho. And that is where we meet this man, Balaam, whom nobody ever names their kid after. The king of Moab a man by the name of Balak, is very frightened of the Israelites. He, he sees this vast people. He knows what they've done to the other kings, and he's worried that they're next, and he knows he can do nothing against them. But he thinks to himself, while he may not be able to fight them militarily, maybe he can harm them by, by cursing them. And he believes if the Israelites are cursed, they'll be too weak to defeat his people. And so he sends for the person that is known to be good at cursing people. He sends for a man by the name of Balaam. Now, Balaam is some sort of spiritist. He's some sort of diviner. He curses people for money. Many people confuse this idea of who Balaam was, and they think that he was some sort of prophet of God. But it's clear as you read about his life and you read it in context, you see that Balaam was not a, a prophet of God at all, but he was a pagan spiritualist. Balaam was like a witch doctor, somebody that would curse people for money. Now, if you've traveled to other countries, maybe you're aware of the fact that um, there are people in other countries that proclaim to be witch doctors. Um, there are people that curse others. There is the occult, even here in the U.S. Satan has different strategies in different parts of the world. And so in the materialistic, atheistic, humanistic West, um, sometimes his activity is, is more hidden, but he's still impacting lives, and, and he's very active. But in other parts of the world, there's, there's people that are very fearful of, of the spirit realm, and there's, there's witch doctors. But it's even here in America. There's a great fascination with an interest in the occult. You may not have known this, but according to a New York Post article from 2018, the article stated that Brooklyn witches are brewing up a swirl of spells that they plan to unleash on U.S. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. The article went on to talk about that. I guess in the U.S. this is something that people even practice today. Well, let's read from Numbers chapter 22, starting at verse 4, about Balaam. And it says this, So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Emoa, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me, perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks 
to me. Now, it's not that Balaam knows the Lord. Um, Balaam certainly heard of, of the Lord, very likely. Um, he's used to talking to spirits. Uh, he thinks they're gods, but they're really just demons that he talks to. His business is blessing and cursing people. Likely, he's putting on a show to pretend that he's going to talk to God. But amazingly, God actually comes and speaks to Balaam. God warns him. God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. Pretty definitive, right? You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Balaam at first listens to God. There's great hope here. He should have started asking, who is this God who has spoken to me? Why is this God protecting his people? Well, the king of Moab uh, won't give up easily. He's in great danger, and so he feels he's in great danger. So he sends a more prestigious delegation to Balaam with promises of, of, of great honor and wealth if he'll come curse Israel. And we read in verse 18 of Numbers 22... Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now this is interesting. Balaam is now calling the God of Israel the Lord my God, he says. And perhaps Balaam claims to follow all the gods, uh, who knows, including the God of Israel. Or perhaps Balaam is being influenced and he's heading in the right direction. And I want to pause here and make it clear that there's only one God. Scripture is very clear about that. And so when we read about other gods, um, these are just idols, these are images, these are demons that, that have influence. Um, there's only one God. One God. So when the Bible refers to God with a small g, it's referring to gods with a small g, it's referring to idols and demons. But there is power behind these idols because of the demonic world. Now, there are a lot of Balaams in this world, aren't there? There's, there's people who, who claim to follow God, but who really do not know him. Jesus warned about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven... On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. A lot of people claim to know Jesus. They call him Lord, Lord, and yet he will say to them one day, depart from me. I never knew you. And so it's essential and important that as followers of his, there will be fruit that comes from our lives, right? We don't earn our way to heaven. It's by grace through faith alone and Christ alone, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. But if you're genuinely saved, there will be fruit. There will be good works that flow from your life. We can't help it. If the living God dwells in us, we can't help but live different. We are changed from the inside out. But Balaam makes this claim to be a follower of the God of Israel. Balaam says to this more prestigious delegation that comes to him, he says in verse 19, So you too, please stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise and go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. Now, we need to make it clear, God has already told Balaam, do not go, do not curse them, right? God has already said this. Balaam wants to go so bad, he, he asked God again if he can go. He wants wealth and honor that will come from cursing Israel. Some people see in verse 20 this conditional clause here, and that the men were supposed to ask him again, and there's no record of them asking him again the next morning. But Balaam took that as, I can go. 
Clearly, God is not happy with Balaam that he went, because we read this in verse 22. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. So God has already told Balaam, don't go. And Balaam keeps asking, and then Balaam goes. Balaam keeps pushing on to go the wrong path of destruction. And I really hope that you're hearing God's voice when he says no, and that you obey him, that you don't go down that path that will cause harm and destruction to your soul. I have seen people throughout the years, and they'll know something is not right. They'll even be warned about it. But they'll figure out a way to justify going down that path anyway. Whether it's twisting what Scripture says, or it's finding a new counselor that will agree with them. They figure out a way to walk in the way they want to go, a way of disobedience that causes harm to their lives. Oh, church, that we would be in God's word and we would obey it and we would hear his voice and heed his instructions. We read this, starting at verse 23. What an amazing passage of scripture. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? What an incredible, what an incredible story. Incredible. There's only two places in Scripture where we see animals talking. In Genesis chapter 3, the serpent, who is controlled um, by Satan... And here this donkey, whom the Lord opens his mouth. This is history. This is true. Amazing. Do you ever wonder what your cat or your dog are thinking? Maybe it's good their mouths aren't open to tell you what they're thinking. But how incredible. Balaam's donkey speaks to him. We can say this. Balaam was so blind with this desire for money and honor that his donkey had better spiritual vision than he did. You see the irony, don't you? This man whom nations look to because they believe he's so spiritually attuned that they travel great distances and offer great wealth to give him for his help, he sees less spiritually than his donkey does. <laughs> he's more blind than his donkey. In fact, his donkey is, 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 has much greater spiritual insight than he does. And of course, we might shake our heads and say, Balaam. But I think we need to pause and ask ourselves, is there a little bit of Balaam in each one of us? You see, as I've said over the years, I've seen people make decisions based upon their own feelings, based upon their own wants and desires deceiving themselves into thinking that God is speaking to them when he's not, even though God is abundantly warning them, no child. Balaam was able to justify going, and God in grace and mercy continued to get Balaam's attention. Now, most people believe here that the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate um, visitation of Jesus, right? An, an Old Testament visit of Jesus before he came in the flesh. Um, the reason they believe so is you see this angel, uh, Balaam falls down, right? And, and, and the angel is willing to receive worship. So many believe this is uh, Jesus. A Christophany is another a word for it. Is it possible that we can be like Balaam? 
You see, there's a great danger. And the great danger is this. Balaam's don't know they're Balaam's. <laughs> Balaam's think that they know. Just read 2 Peter again. They, people, they, they, they think they know. They think they're wise. Balaam's think they're spiritual. They think they're in attuned with hearing from God. These false Balaam-like teachers don't know how blind they really are. And that is why it is so credit, critical that we as God's people are in His Word regularly, daily, that we're spending time in His Word, that we would know what God truly says and not be deceived by the world and by false teachers. Oh, that we would hear God's voice and follow His path and plan. We can also say this, that Balaam's love for money and honor led him down the path of destruction that he never returned from. Balaam's greed, his love of money and honor, led him down a path of destruction that he never returned from. Now you might ask, you say, well, what do you mean? Because you say, I've read Numbers 23 and 24, and I see that Balaam did go, but he was faithful to bless Israel those three times. He didn't curse them, you say. And yes, you're right, he, he was obedient. But remember, Balaam is so spiritually blind that he couldn't even see Jesus standing right in front of him as donkey did. Balaam is used by God. He blesses Israel. God gives Balaam some prophecies, which is just amazing. This should have caused Balaam to say, God, you're real, and fall on his knees and care for the people of Israel. Maybe even attach himself to them. But Balaam doesn't do that. As Paul Harvey says, and now for the rest of the story, the rest of the story is Balaam couldn't curse Israel for money, but he could get Israel to harm themselves through compromise and sin. And so here's what Balaam did according to Revelation chapter 2. He instructed the Moabite and Midianites to send their women into the Israelite camp to seduce the Israelite men to lead them into immorality and to idolatry. A plague ended up striking Israel. 24,000 Israelites died. Balaam, so in love with money, ignored the fact that God was speaking to him and that God was blessing these people. And he went against God. How scary is that? I wonder how many Balaams might even be listening to the message today. You've heard God's voice at some point in your life. You've seen God's miraculous hand of protection or intervention or guidance in your life. And yet for a little bit more bread, a little bit nicer of a house, you've abandoned the God who speaks. Let me encourage you. Let me plead with you. Run back to his loving arms today. Seek his mercy and his grace. Don't let greed blind you. Don't let greed destroy you. Materialism, it just ruins many people's lives. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Perhaps you heard about the man who opened the door of his BMW when suddenly a car came along, hit the door, ripping it off completely. When the police arrived at the scene, this man was complaining bitterly about the damage to his precious BMW. Officer, look what they've done to my Beamer. He whined, you're so materialistic, you make me sick, retorted the officer. You're so worried about your stupid BMW that you didn't even notice that your left arm is ripped off. <laughs> oh no, the man said, looking at his bloody shoulder where his arm once was. Where's my Rolex? <coughs> Silly story, of course, but many people live that way with their souls. They're so in love with money, they're so enticed by possessions and things that they don't know the damage, the destruction that is bringing to their lives. Balaam may have harmed Israel, but he could not destroy Israel or thwart God's plan. We read about Balaam's fate in Numbers 31. It says this, verse 7, They fought against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every man. Among their victims were Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. 
Balaam didn't get away. He didn't get away with it. He could have been a great hero of the faith. He could have been another Ruth, another Rahab, a Gentile attaching themselves to the people of Israel and being blessed and being a blessing. But the love of money destroyed his life. We read this as we draw to a close in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 8 to 12. Please allow the Spirit to speak to each of our hearts. But if you have food and clothing, with these we will be content. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life which, which you were called and about, with, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. All oh, that we would run after him with all of our hearts and our lives. Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the hope of the world. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you believe that Jesus lived a perfect life and died in your place? Rose again on the third day? Have you recognized your sin? Said, Lord, I, 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 I turn from that sin and I turn to you. Would you make me new? Would you wash me clean? Have you done that? Are you following Christ? Are you forgiven in Christ? Are you a new creation in Christ? And if then, if you're following him, you're a believer, are you pursuing these things that, that, that Paul speaks about to Timothy? Righteousness. Are you pursuing these things? Are you running after Christ? And if you're not, can I encourage you today, get on your knees and repent of anything that doesn't belong. And say, God, help me, because I don't want to go the wrong way. I don't want to pursue the wrong road. I want to pursue you, Jesus, with all my heart as I await your coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your gracious warnings in your word. We thank you that we can learn um, both in a positive way from people that did well, and we can also learn what to avoid from the destructive behavior of others. Thank you for these warnings we have in Scripture about the dangers of greed. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to pursue you, to hear your voice, to listen to your will and your word, and to follow you. Help us not to go down a path of destruction, but help us to follow and go down the path of life as we pursue you. We love you, Jesus, and we give you thanks and praise that you are our help, our Savior, our soon and coming King. And we cling to you in faith and trust and ask that you would give us all the strength that we need as we run this race. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.
Sense of the world. 